We're here today, Barry Tunday Thurston, founder of CultivatedWit.com. And what brings you here to the Dublin website? So I flew in an airplane, which is great. Preferred method of travel between New York and Dublin. And I'm in town for Web Summit and for Founders. Uh, and Patty and his crew invited me to come and talk about comedy in the code and the intersection of comedy and technology. Based on my background at The Onion, where I worked for five years as director of digital, as a comedic author, as a stand-up comic, and just a big tech geek. Uh, what can we do by bringing those two things together? That's what my new company is all about, and I think that's what the world needs a bit more of. And you spoke a bit today about something called Comedy Hack Day that you held. Can you talk about some of the products and services that came from that? So Comedy Hack Day was the brainchild of one of my colleagues, Craig Cannon. And Hack Days are very popular within the startup and developer community, and there have been a lot of thematic ones. There's been a music hack day, there's been an art hack day. No one had ever done a comedy hack day, which would basically bring developers and comedians together to code, design, build, pitch, and demo uh, funny apps. So we did that about a month ago. It was the first time that we could ever find that it had been done anywhere in the world. We did it in New York. We're going to do it again in San Francisco in the first quarter of next year. And we got 23 apps out of this weekend. 60 people showed up, broke up into teams. Some teams did multiple apps because they were just that motivated. Um, but it was hilarious. And some of them were building on APIs from Mashery or from Twilio or from Talkbox or from the Sunlight Foundation or the government. And so you see all these technology platforms that are really most heavily being promoted by people who understand them. They're being promoted by technologists and developers and coders and people who speak in code and an algorithm. There's a whole nother layer of depth that we can get to when we bring artists into the mix to co-create with those technologists and comedians are a big part of that. So we had one app, uh, this was ridiculous, it encouraged you to pee on uh, institutions that have wronged you. So if you got fired or you waited too late in the, too long in a line or a queue of some kind, uh, the app was called Pee Here. You could rally your friends to publicly urinate on them. That did not win uh, for some weird reason, not sure why, but that was one strain of innovation that came out. Uh, and then others that were building on corruption in politics and really trying to out elected officials for how much time they spend fundraising in our you know, cash-dominated U.S. electoral system. Um, so there's a lot of talk about content strategy these days and you obviously work a lot with com comedic content. Do you think that's the key to content success? Well, I think there are several keys to content success. It's like on a nuclear submarine, you have to have multiple people turn the key at the same time in order to unlock, like to insert the launch codes and then destroying the world should not be very easy. <clears throat> and so in terms of content strategy, I don't think it just comes down to humor, it just comes down to SEO or it just comes down to a social you got to have a combination of things. I think at the heart of it, you got to have a good story. And it's got to be authentic. It should have some kind of personality to it. Uh, and it should speak with respect to the audience you're trying to reach out to. Comedy as a subset of storytelling is quite powerful. You can draw people in with a joke that would never listen to a heartfelt you know, treatise on the value of this particular position or to an angry tirade or to a pile of facts and figures. There's something very emotional and very accessible about humor when it comes to communicating a story. So I do think comedy can be really important, but I will not say that it's essential to every content strategy because that just creates too much competition for me. Like everybody shouldn't try to be funny. That's crazy. That's bad. And you kind of touched on something I was going to ask you about anyway, in that uh, comedy on the internet, I mean, it flows really easily, it really reaches out to people. And I've also noticed that the US presidential election that's happening now, it's the comedic sound bites that are really taking people's imagination. Do you think it's this com com comedy and technology uh, fusion is the way to communicate with the new generation? I think it's a, a big part of it. I think it absolutely is. There was a comment in the debate, the second presidential debate between Mitt Romney and uh, President Obama, and Mitt Romney made a comment, uh, they asked, a woman asked about what's the role of women in your view of the American future, what opportunities are you going to create, and Romney bragged about his term as governor of Massachusetts, uh, where Boston is, which is heavily Irish, by the way, lived there for 12 years. Um, and he said, you know, he was trying to get a lot of women in his cabinet to serve in his administration, and they gave him binders of women. And it's just a very strange phrase, like binders of women. That took off immediately. There were Tumblr sites. There's a very popular Tumblr site, bindersofwomen.com. There's a Facebook page. There's a Twitter account with tens of thousands of people. This is while the debate's still going on. So there's an ability to, like surfing, kind of catch the wave of a cultural moment, of a political cultural moment, and have people contribute to it. And there's something uh, sometimes amateurish and silly about it, but often really inspiring and hilarious, too 
when in past cases, everyone was waiting to see what Saturday Night Live would do with that moment four days from now. Now it's like four seconds from now and it's thousands of people sort of co-creating around that, that moment. And in that moment, people are kind of getting involved in a political debate at the same time. And with your work on The Onion and with the location-based racism, uh, you're also addressing what is actually a wider issue. So is that kind of what you're really trying to hit at with comedy and technology? I think with comedy and tech, it's, you know, we have this listed on our website that we don't work for evil. All right, like there is a, this is a powerful weapon. And we don't want it in the hands of rogue states, like a defense contractor or something. That we're probably not going to work for McDonnell Douglas. Um, so there is a higher calling to some of this. And I'm not saying everything we work on is going to be super noble. But in terms of location-based racism, this app that builds on Foursquare and Yelp to find people identifying or being racist around you, uh, that's a bit of a silly exercise. But it's also reminding us that there is a serious situation there and exposing a layer of society that many people say no longer exists. And it's a way of accessing a conversation that's really awkward for some people. Folks get really offended, people get really defensive. I wrote a book called How to Be Black, right? And, part, and it's a comedic book. It's not a sociological report because I wanted to invite people around this table to talk about something that still needs resolving. So there is a power when you take humor and its ability to cut through awkwardness, tension, nonsense and bullshit and when you take digital and its ability to connect with people in a rapid way and in a a more equal footing and a participatory way there is some magic that can happen i think we can see issues in a different way again it's not on its own enough location-based racism.com isn't going to end racism all by itself but it may bring a few other people to the table who may never have played along before because they didn't think it had anything to do with them